Well, welcome to our um, first pick meeting of the year, and I'm going to get started even though I know people are coming in. We're very conscious that we try to hold this uh, meeting during your lunch time, and we try to keep it to an hour. Sometimes we're successful, sometimes we're not in doing that. Um, but welcome, and we were really happy to see the number of folks we've had. We, through the 10 years that I've been doing this, we've had at times 30, 40, 50 people, and then there's been times where we have stood in front of two or three people um, and doing this, and so it's always a better conversation when we have uh, um, a larger group. So here's the format for today. We have two topics we're gonna talk to you about. We have a number of presenters, and so we'll go through the both topics and let them present, and then at the end we can have questions and comments as we go through. Um, we do run over the hour. Feel free to leave. I know some people are on their lunch period, and then we'll we can always continue even up it, once we set this, uh, the tape off if we need to at the hour. So again, welcome, have a seat, and we're gonna get started. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jen's service who will um, start off the present presentation and introduce folks. Raise it up a little higher. Okay. All right, so yes, as Mike mentioned, my name is Jen Service. I'm the elementary curriculum specialist here for Midland Public. Uh, as he mentioned earlier, we do have two topics today. I am here with the MPS literacy team to share with you the different interventions that are happening at the elementary level. And then I will turn it over to Amanda Sherry, our MTSS coordinator for social emotional learning. <clears throat> So to begin, as I said, I'm Jen Service, the elementary uh, curriculum specialist. I am joined today by the amazing MPS literacy team. Uh, I have with us Kim Welter. She supports Woodcrest Elementary and Chestnut Hill. Annalisa Christensen, she supports Central Park, Plymouth, and the Pre-Primary Center. And Shannon Panasic, that supports Adams Elementary and Siebert. We also have with us Trisha Clancy. Uh, we have a partnership with the Claire Gladwin RESD, and she is a literacy coach that supports all of us in this work. Um, we are grounding our work uh, presentation for you today in literacy. We believe as a literacy team that it is truly the gateway to student learning. Um, so we are here to share with you a little bit of the backstory. Uh, starting first with the Read by Grade 3 law. Uh, the Michigan legislature implemented this law in 2016, uh, which does identify third grade students uh, if they are at least one grade level behind in third grade, as indicated on the M-STEP. Uh, there is a chance that those students may be retained. Uh, we have a lot of things in place to support those students, and it really is a collective effort uh, between the literacy coaches, the principals, the parents, um, and the students and teachers at the building for that process. Today, we are going to highlight uh, the role of the literacy specialists in the buildings. We are also going to give you some detailed information on an individual reading improvement plan that is co-created and um, highlight some of the interventions, how they are implemented, uh, how they are decided upon, and how they are monitored. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kim and she is going to share with you some specifics about the role of a literacy specialist. So like Jen said, my name is Kim Welter and I'm the literacy specialist at Chestnut Hill and Woodcrest Elementary Schools. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk a little bit about our role and what we do to help our students be successful with their literacy needs. Um, the first thing we do is we do a lot of coaching. So we use the MDE coaching model through the Michigan Department of Education. Um, you'll see us in classrooms, we meet with teachers, we co-teach lessons, we model lessons with them. Um, we also are involved in the literacy leadership within the district. We provide embedded professional development in classrooms every day, um, and we also provide professional development during district um, PD days. We also collaborate with teachers. We sit down with them. We look at the data, NWEA. We look at DRA, a lot of different informative assessments and some of summative assessments. Um, and we collect that data. We gather the data. We interpret the data. We match interventions with student need. Um, we modify those interventions and modify that data as we go along throughout the um, year to support our youngest learners K-3. So that's what we do. Are you ready, Annalisa? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, make sure I'm on. 
Hi again, my name is Annalisa Christensen, um, and again, I serve at Central Park, Plymouth, and then the Pre-Primary Center. Um, one of the biggest components of our job, as Kim mentioned, is kind of digging into the individualized reading improvement plan. Um, it is in collaboration with the, with the teachers as well as with parents. One of our first stepping stones is the NWA. Once that is um, administered, then we look at NWA data. We also do some more digging deeper assessments as in the BRA, um, a Hegarty phonemic awareness, letter sound ID, um, a phonics inventory to kind of get more information about the student before moving forward with the plan. Um, once we look at all that data, then we decide what instructional strategies and tools we want to put into place in order to support that student's literacy learning. We also then follow up with parents to have a conversation about the plan so that they also can um, receive activities, supports, and suggestions to support those students at home as well. We constantly evaluate the plan, make sure that we are looking um, at the plan and making sure we're supporting the students throughout the year after new assessments and data has been administered. And Shannon's going to talk a little bit more about the intervention specifically. Okay, so I'm Shannon Panasic, um, and I am going to share a little bit about our reading interventions at the elementary level. Uh, they are provided by the teacher, they're done daily, uh, they're provided to the kids that have individualized reading improvement plans but they're also provided to other students that data shows they need a little extra help and support. So everything we do with that plan is based on data. So we look at formative assessments, summative assessments, um, screeners, and then what we do is, like Annalisa said, we put that plan together. Uh, while, while the students are receiving an intervention, uh, we progress monitor that. So that allows us to determine if that is an effective intervention being used. And if it's not, um, we make modifications based on student needs. So that could be a change in the intervention. It could be a change in the frequency of the intervention. Um, so we, we are always looking at that data piece. Uh, this year, because of ESSER funds, we have academic interventionists and a retired teachers program. The uh, academic interventionist are, is a paraprofessional uh, position, and we have one of those at each of the elementary schools. And then we also have retired teachers that come in and also support with um, interventions at our schools. And I think to go along with that, with the academic interventionists, um, our team does get together uh, with that group monthly uh, to provide support to them and different strategies to use with students. So again, even beyond the classroom, uh, this team really does support all efforts that are taking place. Uh, to wrap up our portion of this, I did want to make mention of the school success teams. Um, kudos credit to Amanda Sherry, our MTSS coordinator. Uh, she has worked really hard um, to implement these teams and they are at every building, K-12, so not just elementary. These teams meet monthly, um, and I think this is where I can weave in that we did talk a lot about literacy, but we look at all aspects of student learning. And so if teachers, uh, parents have concerns with their student, um, they um, come to these meetings, and it is a team uh, that meets at these meetings. Parents are part of this collaborative team. My team are part of these meetings, along with the principal and any other key players at the building. Uh, really collaborative effort, again, to support not only the literacy learning, but there's math supports um, that teams can co-create together, not only for struggling students. I think it's important to mention um, those that um, are academically advanced as well. Uh, we often talk about interventions that lie with our struggling learners, but we also have our high achievers, um, and we really want to work hard to make, meet the needs for all. So again, these are held at least monthly meet, uh, in buildings, uh, supports all aspects of learning. They're very collaborative. And again, data is collected, progress monitoring happens, and then follow-up meetings take place to be sure that we have the right supports in place. So again, we're doing really great things at the elementary level. I'm glad we had the opportunity to share those with you today, a uh, brief overview. And I'm going to turn it now over to Amanda. Thank you. Amanda, when you get up, one thing you'll learn is we educators love acronyms. <laughs> and, and so, um, you know, 
Yeah. <laughs> After 39 years, I learned that parents don't always understand their acronyms, so we need to spell out. So, first, man, the first thing is MTSS. You may want to oh, tell yes. what that is. Yeah. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, I do have two of our social emotional learning specialists with us here today. I have um, Deborah Winstone. She is at Chestnut Hill in the pre primary center, as well as Karen Muma, who is at Midland High School. Um, but as far as the talking portion, I'm going to go ahead and go through that. And when we get to questions, then we can all pop in. So the first thing that I would start with is just what multi-tiered system of supports are. So when you say uh, MTSS coordinator, often at meetings that I'm at, parents kind of look at you and I say, essentially what that means is it's, it's my job to make sure we have a system and a place to support all of our learners. That means our learners that are struggling all the way to our learners who are excelling um, and are doing wonderful and need some more challenges. So it's really for the gamut. Um, within this, I just, you may have seen this triangle before, um, but I would just like to point out, so some of the reasons that we do MTSS, or multi-tiered system of supports, um, is really because the Michigan Department of Education indicates that it's important we have this comprehensive framework, framework um, and it's a collection of research-based strategies. So it's all things that are research-based and evidence-based, and it really works to meet the assets of the whole child. Um, tier one right here is the green area that you see. And tier one is for every student. So every student that is in our buildings, that is like their core curriculum, right? Their academic studies. Um, it also involves things like positive behavior interventions and supports. So things that we're doing to be like, you're doing a great job, you know, all of those positive things. Classroom expectations and hallway expectations and school expectations. So kids know what we're, you know, how, how we go through our day. Um, so that is all within tier one. 100% of our students receive that. This goes around because it just shows you that tier one never goes away. So even if a student moves up and needs some additional assistance, about 15% of our students will need some extra assistance other than just the core curriculum that we have in place and the supports we have at tier one. And so this is students who are getting targeted interventions, typically in a small group. So those could be some of the academic interventions that they were just speaking about. It could be our student support specialist interventions, um, things like that. And then we have about 5% of our students will require even more support, either again because they're struggling or because they're so advanced. And these are really individualized intensive supports. Even within this, they are still receiving all of tier one. So they're still obviously getting the core curriculum and all of the things in place. I would also mention that social emotional learning falls within tier one. Um, so that is just the things that we're doing every day, helping students to understand um, just how to express themselves and understand how to maneuver their environment. Um, the whole child really is cognitive, academic, physical, social, emotional, and behavioral. So when we talk about MTSS, just know that that is all things, um, according to what MDE is saying. So the next piece um, is that MDE is also Michigan Department of Education. Sorry if I didn't say that earlier. Um, <laughs> has also indicated that you know health safety and wellness of all students is really their primary one of their primary focus um, and in order to do that they say a critical way to achieve this goal is through social emotional learning so social emotional learning we are going to utilize the the definition from the collaborative for academic social and emotional learning that's called castle so you'll often hear people refer to that as castle I will probably say CASEL as we go through the presentation. Just know that that's the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning. They do have a website if you are ever interested. Lots and lots of information on there. Um, that is who the Michigan Department of Education tends to look to for our resources in this area. CASEL defines social and emotional learning as the process through which all young people and adults, so it even is referring to adults, acquire and apply the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to develop healthy identities, manage emotions, achieve personal and collective goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain supportive relationships, and make responsible and caring decisions. Okay, according to MDE, there are five core competencies for social and emotional learning. 
Um, those are the same as CASEL, so you'll hear them interchange, but they are the same. MDEs and CASELs are the same. And I'm just going to go through each one of these just to kind of give an overview about what each one means. Because sometimes you can look at self-awareness and you're like, what does that actually mean in real life? So um, when we're speaking about so self-awareness, we're talking about the ability to accurately recognize and identify one's emotions and their thoughts and influence on behavior. Those are things like demonstrating honesty and integrity, um, having a growth mindset, so looking towards the positive and how we're growing, understanding their strengths. So you can imagine how important it is for kiddos to understand their strengths. And really, at the school success team meetings, that's the first thing we start with is strengths. What are the strengths of the student? Um, having a sense of confidence and optimism. Okay, Those are all things that fall under self-awareness. Self-management is the ability to regulate and manage one's emotions, thoughts, and behaviors effectively in different situations in order to manage stress, control impulses, motivate oneself, and set and work towards personal and academic goals. So those are things like uh, teaching self-stress management techniques, right? School is stressful for these kids. It's stressful for adults. Our jobs are stressful. How do we get through the day? Well, we learn how to manage our stress. So that's one of the things that um, falls under self-management. Exhibiting self-discipline and self-motivation. So knowing how to motivate yourself to be able to do the things that you need to do to be successful at school. Um, planning and organizational skills. You can see how that is beneficial. And then taking initiative. So really learning how to, to take initiative on something that you need to do. Uh, the third competency is social awareness. That's the ability to take the perspective of and empathize with and recognize family, school, and community resources and supports. Um, so really it's about the students recognizing strengths in themselves and others, um, demonstrating empathy and compassion. You know, when your friend is crying at school, how do we handle that? How do we, how do we interact in that situation? Um, showing concern for the feelings of others and understanding and expressing gratitude. So showing how to appreciate and express gratitude. The fourth competency is relationship skills. That's the ability to establish and maintain healthy relationships with individuals and groups, communicate clearly, listen actively, and cooperate with others. So that is things, and I know I just said it, but really developing positive relationships. So that's with other students, but also with our staff and our teachers, right? So as little ones, how are we, even into obviously high schoolers and adults, how are we developing relationships with those people around us? Um, practicing teamwork and collaborative problem solving. So how do we function in a team and in a group? Resolving conflicts constructively. So what do we do when we have an issue? Um, how do we resolve that peacefully? Uh, resisting negative social pressure and seeking or offering support and help when needed. So really being a friend to someone else and understanding what to do when someone else um, needs help as well. Our fifth competency according to the Michigan Department of Ed is responsible decision making. Pretty self-explanatory but I'm still going to go over it. Um, so the ability to make constructive and respectful choices about personal behavior and social interactions. So really we're looking at um, evaluating the consequences of our actions. So thinking ahead. If I do this, what will happen, right? If I have this uh, reaction, what will happen? Um, identifying solutions for personal and social problems. And then recognizing how critical thinking skills are useful both inside and outside of school. Which obviously we're using critical thinking skills every day as we maneuver. Um, so as you can see, when you really go through and describe what these competencies are, they are really just comprised of life skills, right? It's the things that we all need to utilize um, to be productive members of our society. They're things that we are utilizing every day when we go to work and we walk around and we greet people. Um, all the things that we're doing throughout the day are all social and emotional um, learning things. Um, also, I want to just target, too, that... This visual, so it shows the five competencies, but it also just targets the, the places that this is occurring, right? So this is happening within the classroom with instruction and classroom climate. So making our classroom safe places where students feel safe and want to be and feel loved and welcome. And then also within our schools, so school-wide culture practices and policies. So having students feel like invited once they come into school. 
um, and feel welcome and that they belong. Um, but then there's also authentic partnerships with families and caregivers. And this is a really, this is a really big one for me. I know p people who know me personally, uh, I have a lot of passion in the area of how we can get our families and our parents to be in, you know, as involved as they can be um, and really be partners in this work because that's when all the things come together, when kids have support in, in all the areas. And then also aligned with the community. We have lots of community agencies within uh, Midland County that are super invested in this work and um, are providing lots of different opportunities in this area. I always like to talk about the why, because I think it's important we know why. Um, and really, why is because it supports the whole child. I am going to read, though, a couple quotes because uh, I can't summarize it in a better way than just reading the way that it is. So the Michigan Department of Education states that SEL competencies help complete the academic process for all youth, infants to school age through graduation. SEL competencies help support a well-rounded education that teaches to the whole child. So we're really not, you know, we're teaching to the whole child and everything that's happening for them. Um, when caregivers and schools focus on the development of the whole child, utilizing SEL competencies to guide instruction and interactions with children and students, academic achievement improves, as well as the skills needed for college and career readiness. And I think that's just important to note, right? What do we all want? We want our students and our, our kiddos to be successful um, in whatever path that means for them, whether it be college or trades or whatever, right? But we are trying to help them and provide them with college and career readiness and success later in life. Um, I also just note that this involves the family and community because that's, that's a really big part of it. Uh, okay, so also just a little bit more about the why. So research, there's been lots of research done around social emotional learning over the years. And um, what they have found is that it leads to improved academic performance and uh, outcomes. One example that I um, typically talk about is that it, it has shown to have an 11 percentile gain on standardized achievement st tests. That's, a, that's pretty significant. Um, it also increases classroom positive behavior, right? So it helps students to be able to be positively functioning within the classroom. It increases their ability to manage that stress. Uh, it helps with their attitude about themselves and about school and about others. Like, how do I feel about myself? And how do I feel about the other kiddos that I'm with during the day? Um, it also has positive effects on our staff. Um, again, this is when I say it's for adults because it's really for adults too. Um, and then it assists with building the skills needed for students to be well regulated. So something I think is important to note here is that when students aren't, and when I say regulated, like able to be present, when, if you've ever had a day where you've come into work and you've had like a terrible day, right? Or you had, maybe you saw an accident on the way into work and you're just shaken up and you're thrown right into work. It's hard to just get in there and focus, right? It's the same thing for our, for our kids. If they've had something happen, or maybe they had, you know, at recess they got into a conflict with their friend, or you just never know, right? Something has happened and they're just not in the space to be able to access that part of their brain that can learn those academics that are so important. If we don't help our students learn, when I feel like that, this is what I can do. Then we're not accessing that, their, their full potential to be able to learn at school. So I just think it's important to talk about the fact that um, Students aren't able to fully access their education if they're not able to be regulated. And we all have that happen, right? It's just what we do with it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you saying that because I wouldn't. Yes. Okay. So self-regulated is just a term that we use within mental health. And all that means is like for them to be able to feel like they have control for themselves. So like if. What kind of things do you do? Yeah, sir. So simple things like, okay, take some deep breaths. I'm just going to take some deep breaths right now. Or I'm going to ask my teacher, I'm really upset about what happened on the playground. Can you, can you help me with that? Those are the kind of things that we mean. I really appreciate you saying that because I wouldn't want it to come across that way. Sometimes we use terms, right? I, my previous background um, is mental health. And so sometimes I use terms like that and don't even think about what that comes across. Does that answer the question? So it's just simple things that we do, whether that be squish some squishies, right? Like 
or maybe you're coloring it out. You take five minutes to take a break. You go get a drink. You go do a sensory path, like those kind of things to help them feel calm. I don't want anything being done to, to a normal child to make them start. Calm. Yeah. Uh, some of this stuff I feel like might push people, or children to, I don't know, not almost sure. the opposite way of what you're trying to do. Right, right, sure, absolutely. Yes, no, and that's totally not what it is. This is, when I say regulated, it's to help the kids who are struggling. Um, so that they have something to do. So for example, if I can just give a quick example of that. Uh, one of the tier one things that has been really beneficial for kids in, in school districts is um, like a calm space within the classroom, right? So maybe they're upset and the teacher has an area that any kid can access. Um, but then if they're really frustrated, like you might feel when you get really frustrated and you're headed into work or whatever is happening for you, that you can, that, that kid can go and take five minutes and they do what, what they need to do, whether that be, usually there's some squishies there, there's coloring things, it's, it's all different for what those kids need, um, but that's what I mean. So they take that space and that time for themselves. It isn't about um, the kids that are already feeling calm. Question. Sure. So this program, <clears throat> um, all the staff and the teachers are trained so they can implement their own kind of interpretation of it as I as I understand I mean the teachers have to know to be able to set these things up and mm -hmm. talk to students a certain way to have them explore what they're feeling and be able to interpret it I assume well but mm -hmm. I, I'm just worried that yeah. we only hear we only hear the bad stuff sure yeah and we've heard some things that were along these lines discussed with the student and my, my student had a real hard time sure as well so yeah yeah. I just want to make sure that I understand that the tools that are being given to them, do you see there being any way to manipulate those tools to have a negative outcome instead of a positive? It's kind of going along with sure. things. Sure. Yep. I just want to make sure that we're also mm -hmm. protecting them just in case. And yeah. the teachers may not be trying to do it, but the family may mm -hmm. have some issues with it. Sure. So I would, the sense. absolutely, and I'm glad you brought it up because um, I actually, when you were here and I saw you came, I think you talked at the last board meeting and I had watched that afterwards and I thought, oh gosh, I would love to, to respond and say, so the first thing I would say is it's not a program. Um, it is a framework. So that seems maybe stupid for me to say that, but really it's not like a program that we're, it's not like a, like a literacy program where you're like, this is what we're doing. It is just about supporting. So it's a framework of making sure that students feel safe and that they belong um, and that they know how to interact with others and they know how to express themselves. It is literally the same things that we, and this is what I think is frustrating, is that it has a name now, right? But it is the same things that we all did when we were in school, when we had a conflict with a peer and we went to our teacher and said, Johnny just called me stupid, right? I'm trying to think of something on the fly. And our teacher had a conversation with Johnny and I about how that makes us feel. Like when you call somebody, that's literally the same thing as what we're talking about. So it's those kind of things. They're like when we would have a group project that we had to do and um, our teachers would help us to work effectively in a group, that's SEL. It's all the things that we always did, but there's a name to it now. And so that makes it sometimes just feel a little like you're pushing everybody down this one path it, it feel if the word sometimes putting a word to it where it's the same things that we've always done and it's yeah funded. and what happens when the funding goes sure so SEL I would say here's the thing about SEL though is it something that we do all day every day so even if you didn't have I'm gonna step outside the lines okay oh. if you even if you didn't have funding for it like I said, it's the same things that we've been doing in school with little kids and our adolescents literally forever. So even if there wasn't funding, teachers would still be saying like, are you okay? Or, oh, you just called this student a name. We need to talk about that because that doesn't make him feel good, right? Or adolescents who maybe are having social conflicts and we're trying to help them work through that. It's that stuff. So even if there wasn't funding, it's the same well, stuff me, we let do. Let me add on to that, man. There's really yeah. no funding. Um, for SEL, there is different forms of pots and funds that came to provide personnel to support it. So SEL is, you know, you may more be familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's really what our teachers do every day 
with students, but now we're able to make sure we're growing a pattern of that with all different types of kids. But there is no funding, there is no bought in curriculum, there is no material like that. What we've done is use some of the federal funding that was flowed from the pandemic to add personnel to support that. And your question of supporting that, yes, we made sure that we um, have a healthy general fund balance that we could to continue to support some of that. If we do have to get smaller, there are positions that usually we lose some certain amount of positions per year that we would be able to keep those positions through attrition into, into the organization. So one Can, more thing. Yeah, and then I don't want to forget to say something. Yes. Um, so some of the tough lessons that have to be learned when you're young is conflict resolution. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's without having... Someone mediate it. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm a little concerned with that. And certainly we don't want to have people fighting on the playground to sure. figure out all the <coughs> yeah. decisions. So that doesn't work out. Yeah, yeah. So what I would say is it's not... Yeah, I would say it's not black and white, right? Like, so there's going to be conflicts that happen all the time that p maybe teachers don't pick up on if it's something that happened at recess. When I say this, I'm talking more about the things that are inhibiting that kid from progressing that day, right? So something happened and now they are, they're no longer able to access their academic piece because they're stuck, because they're stuck with what happened. But, it, but it's one day. I mean, I've right. had it all the time. Yeah. I'm only, I'm only able to do what I can do now because For I sure. struggle through it. So yes. I, I'm worried about that. Sure, I appreciate that. Can I also, before I forget, I want to say something though, because I was, I was excited to see that you came here. Because um, I wanted to tell you that there was, I hope it's okay that I do this. I don't always pop, yeah, okay. So when you spoke, you had said, like there are lots of pretty words in that, right? But what's actually happening? And I sat and I thought about that for a minute and I really reflected. And I just wanted to validate you and say that I think what you were re maybe referring to is that it wasn't that, and again, in this presentation, it's not me saying we are taking this curriculum and we are teaching these 10 lessons and it is happening during this class period and this is what's happening. And that's probably part of the reason that it's like, but what is really happening? Yeah. It's hard to describe because that's not it. It is the stuff that we're doing every day to maneuver our environment. That's why it feels like, but what is that? It's just the things that we're always have been doing, but now they have a name. And that's, I think that's why it feels like, but what does that mean? mean well it literally just means that we're teaching kids how to so I don't, how to be good people yeah yeah I, yeah and i don't know how we get around that because it seems yeah. like today especially there's a lot of words used to do things that i would completely disagree with but they sure anybody sure. would buy into it everybody right. agrees with it but at the end of the day it, it still feels, feels not safe feels like not safe right. okay so that's why i'm worried about yeah it. i'm glad to hear everything you have to say yeah well i appreciate you you listening i want to keep Nope. No, it's okay. Yeah, you, you sure? Yeah, we have time for questions at the end. Okay, sure. well, let me sure. keep going. Don't questions. lose it. Okay. We'll, we'll have plenty of time. For okay. Um, so this is just some of the things that we're doing here at, at Midland Public Schools. Um, so one of the things is MPS resiliency, which also encompasses the RISE model. RISE stands for Resiliency in Students and Educators. It's been around for, it's a partnership with Sarah Owens Consulting. It's been around for a long time. Um, but essentially what we're doing is, we are focusing on helping uh, adults understand um, the brain and body's reaction to stress or adversity, right? So like when we get stressed, how we respond. Um, it's the same things that you are doing every day. Um, this not only includes the students, but we're really teaching the adults how they respond, right? So like if they've had a really hard day and they come in and there's a kid who's really escalated, recognizing within themselves that I need to calm myself so that I and not um, so I can help that child better. Um, and so anyway, to date, we have 77 teachers who participated in either RISE or MPS Resiliency and 25 paraprofessionals who have participated in that as well. Uh, we have eight SEL specialists. We have six at the elementary and pre-primary and two at the high school. Uh, and they really focus on staff. They're there for staff. So helping teach staff about trauma-informed practices, um, coaching staff, providing professional learning. Um, the SEL specialists, so the social emotional learning specialists at the elementary uh, setting also provide something called structured reflection. So it's really a, 
a space for teachers to be able to just kind of reflect and process on how uh, things are for them and um, gives them a safe place to kind of work work through some of the things that happen, right? Like that secondary trauma that comes in. Um, and then they also work on restorative practices. They help students reintegrate into the classroom after they've had a suspension um, or a conflict. They help build teacher-student relationships. That's a huge piece of this work is like the more relationships that we have, the safer and uh, our schools will be and the happier our kids will be, as well as our adults. Um, and so they work on all of those things. And then we also have our student support specialists. Their role is completely different. Um, so they are licensed or limited licensed clinicians. They're actual mental health workers um, who provide direct sessions uh, to students who are struggling with mental health at the mild to moderate level. Um, it is important to note that consent has to be received. So they do not work with a student and provide mental health services uh, without parent consent. There are two times that that may not happen. One is if a kid is in crisis and we have a student who's suicidal or homicidal, we have, a, we have an obligation as a, as a uh, licensed clinician that we're going to help that kid. Obviously, if a kid says they're going to kill themselves, we're not gonna not help them. So in that instance, in a crisis, um, they do not need parent consent. If they were to follow up though and continue, they would. Also, in a situation like that, the parent's gonna be contacted, right? Obviously, we're gonna have um, the parent contacted in that situation. And then the other time is if uh, a student is 14 years or older, then we have to follow the Michigan Mental Health Code. Michigan Mental Health Code says that um, students ages 14 and up uh, are able to get 12 sessions of mental health therapy. You can actually look that right up on the Mental Health Code. It is unlawful for us to deny that. So uh, we continue to try to encourage those kiddos to let the parents be part of the process. Um, we, we believe that parents obviously should be. We have to follow the mental health code, but we continue to encourage that kid to have the parent involved. If the student at the 12th session says no, then sessions are done. That's it. The services are over. Um, so we really are very strict about following what the mental health code says. Can you say that again? So after yeah. they get 12, yep. um, parents just need to be involved. If they're 14 or older. If they're 14 or older, you're encouraging them to bring the parent on. Yes. So after the 12, then we legally can't. Okay, so the, the parent really needs to be involved by that, that's what you're saying. That's the hope, right? Okay. Yeah, okay. yep, so, and the, the student is made knowledgeable on that right away. So the student is told right up front, like if you choose not to have your parent involved, then this is what will happen. We, we can help you, but there comes a point where we can't, we can't continue those sessions without your parent's involvement. Um, this school year, not this school year, sorry, last school year, 21 to 22, uh, those mental health therapists we had, I would say five and a half, just because one of them came on in like March of last year, provided 2,713 sessions for our students who were struggling. Um, that's a pretty big deal, right? That's a lot of kids who wouldn't have gotten help if, if they didn't um, have access to that. I should also mention, just on a side note, that there is a requirement that they are coordinating with outside care providers. So they have to coordinate with that um, student's primary care physician and they, with parent consent. So we have a consent form that the parent fills out for that as well. And if that student receives outside therapy services, we also have um, obligation to coordinate with that outside therapy. So we're really working together with the community and the parent and the student all together. Uh, focused efforts on prevention. So really, it, that's where we're trying to get to, right? On preventing kids from struggling rather than reacting. Think about how much happier our kids would feel, right? If we could catch things at the beginning and, and eventually have um, things be preventative. So we're working on preventative strategies such as restorative practices, um, trauma-informed practices. And what that just means is that helping teachers to understand uh, what students who have experience trauma, what that looks like. So sometimes we may see a student who's screaming and yelling, right? That might happen. But that could very well likely be because that student has undergone some trauma. So we just have to be cognizant of that. So we're just educating our teachers on that, um, creating safe, safe schools for them to be able to be in. Uh, mindfulness lessons are at the elementary school um, and the pre-primary center. 
and those are for the teachers that are participating in the resiliency training. <clears throat> and then, by the way, with that, just to add, uh, any time that mindfulness lessons are provided, there is letters that are going home to the parent every single week detailing what it is that is happening, what they're talking about. There's a letter that goes home before they even start lessons that very specifically describes what it is so that there's no like worry, right? Like about what are you actually gonna teach my kid during mindfulness? Um, it's very clear exactly what it is. Very simple things like breathing and things like that. Um, so parents are always in communication with that. And then we have sensory pathways that we're trying to get in our building. So just a, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen one, but um, they're just, how would you describe it? It's just like a pathway that kids can take sometimes when they're really frustrated or, or stressed. I almost said not regulated, but not gonna do that. Um, but anyway, and so they, they might jump down the path or do some, some, something sensory that helps their body and then they can return back to what, what they need. Safe spaces in the classrooms, I talked about those earlier. Um, and then staff well-being, we have things like the structure reflection I talked about. And then uh, at Midland High, Karen has worked really hard to have a resource and wellness center for staff to be able to utilize. Students sometimes utilize that as well when they're, excuse me, with staff. And then connection activities. We also have partnerships with the Legacy Center, Midland Area Wellbeing Coalition, um, Community Mental Health, The Rock, uh, partnership with Discover U for SEL at the secondary level. Um, those are really in the very beginning stages. We're still working out what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, really just helping our staff to understand uh, what, what it means, right? What does it mean to uh, help students with their social and emotional learning or just be a, a socially and emotional learning present? Um, embedded SEL in alignment with PYP. So if you, I don't know if you know much about PYP, primary years program, okay? Um, and that's at our elementary buildings. And really, social and emotional learning, those competencies that we talk about, line up very closely with our PYP approaches, which, are, which is the framework within our elementary buildings. And then uh, we have Mindful Me. It's an MSU extension that's available to all second grade classrooms. Kids really enjoyed that last year. We have grief groups going. Um, Again, th those things don't occur without parents being knowledgeable of them. So if there is a child who really is struggling with some grief, um, the uh, permission slip would go home and the parent could choose yes or no if they wanted them to participate. But that's coming in from the Children's Grief Center. So we're pulling in the Children's Grief Center for that. And then uh, we have our staff engaging in learning through TRAILS, which is transforming research into action and improving the lives of students. And that is through the Michigan Department of Education and also the University of Michigan. And again, this is for our actual, like our student support specialists and our counselors. So it's just teaching them um, different techniques that they can utilize with students to help them calm. Um, it's also providing some suicide risk assessment, like what do we do when we have a kiddo that comes in and, and is in that place and making sure that we're following uh, the protocol that would keep them the healthiest. This is just some pictures of uh, some of the things. So we have some, if you went into an elementary building, in every single one of them, you would see a um, social emotional learning billboard where they're trying to create the awareness of what it is, right? So you could go up and you could see exactly what it is that they're working on. Um, this is the Resource and Wellness Center. So in the end, I just wanna conclude, um, probably have said this 17 times, but that's okay, I'm gonna say it again. Um, just that SEL really is just a label or a name uh, for the same things that we've been doing forever with kids um, to, achieve, to achieve sorry, post-secondary attainment, to support their academic progress and ability for employability, critical thinking, goal attainment, all the things. Um, it's really just trying to help them to be productive and successful members of our society in, in the end. So, okay. So we got both groups available for questions and or comments, and we can kind of direct them to where we oh. see the best personnel to answer your questions or comments. So if you want to raise your hand, I'll kind of keep it in an orderly fashion. Yes, you Sorry, I just have to blow my waiting. nose quick. Yeah. I've been super sick lately. It's okay, yes, okay. okay. Um, All right. So my, my kiddos um, are in second and fourth, and it's really 
fun because they brought home a lot of mindfulness and a lot of meditation um, techniques. And honestly, we were wondering if there's like uh, support for parents to be practicing some of that at home because yeah. they know, look at us and they're like, Dad, you need to take a breath. <laughs> yeah. What are your feelings right now? And it's great, but he's like, well, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's bad. Kids are so, uh, so, yeah. Yeah, no, they're so great. They are. So, like, um, so I was wondering if there's, um, like, honestly, any outreach for parents. Absolutely. To, like, start it more at home to support them, but also ourselves because, like, we didn't do mindfulness. Right, right, I know. Yeah. yeah, so for sure, and what I would say is that um, if you wanted to reach out, your your best bet is to reach out to the SEL specialist, which if you talk later and you let me know what school you're at, I can yeah. tell you exactly who that is. Okay. Um, but really, they're a resource for our families and our staff. Um, they aren't really working one-on-one -on -one with kids unless there's like a situation where, you know, obviously all hands are on deck and we're, you know, just trying to support, support people. But um, yes, they would be a great resource for that. And then there are other things in our community that also can support that, okay. uh, like Partners in Change offers some things on mindfulness for adults. Okay. Um, but I can definitely connect you with some things Thanks. too if you would like. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was going to say there's also in the community every yes. the wellness. The Wellbeing Coalition. Well coalition. So and every. They have mindfulness stuff yes. Like Zoom, you log in. Yeah. That. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah, yes. So. There's actually live yeah. sessions. Yeah and mm -hmm. many of those where you can go to and you can take a live session as a parent and all that. The other mm -hmm. thing I'll add is um, there may be a few people in the room that remember one time that schools did something called Parent University and so we may be looking at that again. I think the discussions come up multiple times about um, bringing you in, those who want to volunteer and we'll talk about how you can help us with literacy at home, mindfulness, all the different things that are going on and because that parent partnership component of it. And so it's called Parent University. You get to go around Robin to some sessions. And so we're, we're gonna relook at that as well. Yeah, that's, yes. And no too. So sometimes we get some things that come down and I always try to uh, send it off for the communique. So you can always check at the end, you're right. There is that, uh, there's a well-being, the well-being coalition updates every month. Also with that, it just made me think I had gotten an email from one of our SEL specialists at the elementary level. Uh, a student had a safe space at school, right? Not that student, but like the classroom had a safe space, right? And um, the kiddo came home and was talking about it and was trying to make something like that so that they had like a space when they were mad at home that they could do. And so they, they made that with their parent and it was so powerful. and. Um, I don't know, just little things like that, I think, are, those are the things we don't always get to see. Yeah. What are the requirements for someone to become an SEL counselor or yes. a person that helps? Thank you for asking. Yes, so SEL specialists, because they do not provide mental health services to students, they either have a, uh, ours that we have are either limited licensed school, so, or limited licensed social workers or licensed social workers. And then also teachers or a licensed professional counselor or a school counselor. So they are not doing mental health though. So we do have, um, so like when we do our structured reflection, for example, with our staff, um, we partner a teacher with a clinician because we're not gonna have a teacher obviously leading something that um, could get into something that feels mental health wise at, with our teachers. So we always partner them with a, an actual clinician. Yes, so for them, because they don't actually deal with mental health with the student um, and provide mental health services that way, they either can be a teacher or a clinician. Yeah, yes, yes, a lot, lots of training, always training. That's my, yes, right guys? Yeah, okay, um, sorry, yes, no, I appreciate you asking, right? You wouldn't know. I don't even think about it because it's just my life, I feel like. Right? I mean, Amanda, before you yeah. go on to the next one, um, this might touch on your funding question too. So the, this, there is a grant that we all receive and it, state of Michigan was a little bit behind and actually get involved. Some of this is um, tapping into federal dollars, Medicare dollars um, as well. And so I don't think these funds are ever going away. They continue to grow on us and, and it came out of the health crisis that they were seeing with kids and certainly exasperated it during the pandemic period. And so that's where we've gotten most of these people is this tying in and it's a, a match thing between the state and the federal government on those pieces of it. And I was just going to go in the licensing, it's very specific on what we have to have when the training of that as well. So it's so kind of tied to both. Are all mental health training 
social worker people? No, because remember, the, they are the SEL specialists that are here, the, their literacy. The SEL specialists, because they do not do mental health with kids, they either can be a licensed or a limited licensed clinician or a teacher. However, our student support specialists, they are the ones that provide the actual mental health services. So they're doing mental health therapy with students. That is funding that comes through the state through 31N. Um, and there is very specific guidelines that you have to have in order to provide those services. So um, we have to either have a, uh, a licensed or a limited licensed social worker, which is the same thing that you would have if you, essentially, it's the same thing that you would have if you went to get therapy outside at a clinic. Um, they have to have the same degree as them. Um, so you can also be a licensed professional counselor. The ones that we have are all licensed clinical social workers, so licensed master's level social workers, or a limited licensed master's level social worker. Um, and last year we had an LPC, but this year we don't have an LPC, they're all okay. so social workers. LPC? Yeah, licensed professional counselor. Um, it's just another degree that you can have to go into mental health. Thank you for asking, yeah. Sure. Yep. Um, or there's like psychologists, but we don't have, have those on staff either. We have to follow the guidelines that 31N puts out. Um, and I'm pretty picky about the people that we have, um, that they are constantly uh, working together to make sure that we're improving our practices, they get professional development, to make sure that they're following um, the most research-based things. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so how do you, um, how do you monitor that proficiency? Of your yeah. Staff? Yes, well, I have to actually evaluate them. So I go and I can um, do observations of them. Um, also, we utilize a system called BH Works that comes down again from that 31N funding. And so it's a, uh, a system where we document the stuff. So I could go in and I could check what my clinicians are doing with students every day. And I should add that I'm a licensed master's level social worker. So I. Um, I guess that's probably important to know. So it is a licensed mental health provider who is supervising those mental health providers to make sure that we're following um, ethical stuff. Yeah. And that data that's in that site goes between you and your social workers that are working. I can see the data, but they can only see their data. Yeah, of course. Um, does that, and that can be shared with the PCP of the how does that that's a great question out? yeah yeah it doesn't it doesn't it could be accessed by our the numbers could be accessed by our ESA our education service agency so our 31 n dollars come funneled through them so they Not get the, names, but the numbers you said is that what you meant? the numbers yes so um, they so for example let me give you an example before we had this system because this is new this year at the beach works um, they each had their own tracking log and I was the only person that could see it, so I'm the only person that can see the names that are on it, um, which I think is important, right, so that I can monitor, make sure we're doing what we need to be doing. And then um, at the end of the year, I take the numbers, so I add up those numbers, and that's how I got that number. Um, I add up all the numbers, and that number is, is reported to the ESA, who provides the funding. Does that answer the question? Yeah, so your ESA acts as a flow through the state of Michigan. They collect the data, but no names. It's only data that we have to, to meet to the grant. And, mm -hmm. and a little bit out of my reign, but we do have people who deal with the grant portion of it. So it's just compliance. Anytime the state sends grants, there's lots of compliance. And mm -hmm. so it's yeah. good and bad on that component, but no names. So and FERPA, would that would be a FERPA violation on that. Yeah. Okay. And the, you said the, uh, the doctor as well. You asked that. Yeah. Um, so when they begin services, and they have the parent complete the consent form for treatment. Um, we also give the authorization to disclose information. And so with on that form, they can pick what they want to be disclosed. Does that make sense? Um, so most of the time, most parents just pick code 16, which is all information, because we're not sending a ton of stuff to doctors, right? Like, who, honestly, you guys, who has time? For that when we're trying to help the mental health of our kids like there's there's a lot going on for kids these days so um, it is and so it it literally consists of when we connect with a primary care physician we have a cover letter and that cover letter which is um it just states like this student is receiving uh, mental health student support specialist services from Midland Public Schools and then there's a line and on that line the clinician would just write 
like an example of what they're working on. So for anxiety within the school, right? Like we keep it pretty general um, because it's the kid's privacy um, and the parent's privacy, but we could disclose more if the parent wanted more to be disclosed, right? So, yeah. I have two quick questions. Sure. Website that you mentioned. Yeah. I'm really curious about Absolutely. the origins of all of this. And yeah. You talked about how they're refining their definition to, for something called transformative SEL. Sure. It talks about that that is to transform inequitable settings and systems and promote justice oriented civic engagement. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious if, since you guys, the DEI seems to be a big piece sure. of the mission. Is this going to be sort of brought in under that? To, is this something you're working towards or looking to? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So I went to an SEL conference last year that was all SEL. And they talked about this transformative SEL. And my takeaway from that is that it's SEL, but it's essentially just noting that we obviously are being inclusive of people of different cultures and different backgrounds and things like that, which in and of itself is SEL. So, um, yeah. The part where it says, promoting justice-oriented civic engagement. To me, that's getting kids to maybe go, you know, be, be out as activists. So I didn't know oh. that was something, because that's the, kind of the way I read it. Sure. So whatever comes out of that go, would have to go through a vetting process. Yeah. So Amanda wouldn't have that say on that. Yeah. And so that would no. be the school board and I vetting and then coming down through the resources with parent. So Penny, part of the school improvement process of that. So I think, uh, you're right, there's, there's some movement there, but I can't tell you that we have any intent uh -uh. of doing anything at this point in time until we know what it is and it comes through mm -hmm. vetting process through the district. Okay. We're very, very careful to vet and take mm -hmm. steps before we go through this. Yeah, the second quick question. Yeah. So there was an incident last week at Jefferson where there was a fight amongst oh. some students. Okay. okay. And um, so the principals came in and the resource officer came in and talked about a law that our kids could be breaking if they were videotaping. Sure, anyway, okay. It kind of, when my daughter came home and told me, I'm like, okay, all this mental health concern mm -hmm. about making kids feel safe, yet they were showing a law that my daughter was kind of like, I don't, I don't really know exactly what he said because they're eighth graders. Yeah. So that, to me, would have been something important for uh -huh. y'all to send to parents and go, this is the law that the officer read to your kids. And sure. And get X, Y, Z, because she wasn't really clear. Yeah. But the officer came in in his uniforms. So it was it's quite intimidating. intimidating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it didn't really yeah. to me match up with what y'all are saying about creating a safe space yeah. and for those kids to feel mm -hmm. because they those kids in the class were not involved in the fight. Mm -hmm. Those girls were expelled. I'm pretty sure suspended. But the kids in the class were told because they watched it, they could be breaking the law and they videotaped. Anyway, we just, were scaring them. Yeah. yeah. So so that's really that's really yeah. Was not yeah. Told what was yeah. told to my daughter or what yeah. law she could be breaking or any mm -hmm. of those. It well, kind of doesn't line up yeah, I, I, will, I hear you. I yeah. will find that out for you. Okay. So you can yes. bring that through to me or Mr. Yeah. Jaster. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so obviously I get involved okay. in everything. Yeah, just, but Mr. Yep. Jaster would have the principal, so I don't know what occurred, but we will, we yeah, will certainly what, find out yeah, and get I, back with you. I have listened to this SEL presentation yeah. about feeling kids safe. Yeah, and belonging. Yeah, yeah, and yes. And this was evidently done to all the 8th grade history class. So, so here's, anyway, no, confusing. here's what I, totally, here's what I would say. Um, this, we are in baby stages, right? Like we are just getting to the point where we're trying to recover from all the things that have happened the last couple of years. And so, and our staff themselves are still learning what even SEL means. Like we started the year by me teaching them all the same things I just taught to you. This is the same stuff that you've always done. It just sounds different because they put words to it, right? And so we're literally in this spot of just starting these processes. So it doesn't surprise me that something like that, right, may feel a little incongruent. Um, restorative practices is where my head goes to with that. So really uh, just at some point, maybe pulling those kids together to talk about how you were feeling in that situation. And um, is there anything that we need to, to, to do, right? What does Kelsey stand for again, Amanda? Yeah, Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning. Okay, good. Yeah. So we're at one o'clock. I'll let anyone who needs to leave go from lunch. We'll touch the cameras, but we'll stay and answer questions if that works for everybody. But I just want everyone to know who we were sneaking their lunch period out that it is one o'clock and we'll continue. Can I just interject? Yep. Our literacy team needs to get back to the schools. Are there any questions? I have a question for the literacy team. <laughs> She's like, I did. Yes. Um, the school success teams. Yeah. Um, can you give me an example of like what things yeah. are working? Yeah. Can I answer that better? Okay. Oh, yeah. 
can I, yeah, because, no, you're fine. They're on them, but we, yes, but I, like, attended all of them last year and got them from the baby stages. So can you just ask the question one more time, because yeah. I was can thinking. Can you give an example of, like, what you're working on in there? Yeah. And, like, how parents are involved? Yes, and I wish that I had parents here who have been at them, because parents are, um, at the elementary level, I, I always say, like, you're the most important person at the table. And I really mean that at my court, because y parents know the kids way better than teachers know the kids, right? Because you're the parent. And so when we have parents at the table, there's this whole other side of the situation that we would have never known. So let me think of a couple examples. Um, sometimes it can be academic things. So maybe it's a student who has has an IREP. So an, uh, uh, thank you. Yep, see I'm social worker, I'm not the teacher. Um, individualized reading intervention plan. So they may have um, an IREP, right? So they struggle in reading. But they also are struggling in math. And so we come to the table. Is it okay if I kind of walk through what it looks like, that one? Would that, is it? Okay. Okay, good. So I'm going to keep going. Sorry. Um, and so what happens is we come to the table. There is, um, I have an agenda that I've created so that parents have something to see exactly what's going to happen while they're there. So they get an agenda. We go around and we do introductions. So at the teams, um, we have a variety of different expertise there so that really we have just people from all different um, areas to be able to problem solve. So we might have a school psychologist, we might have a teacher consultant. We definitely have at the elementary level for sure we have that general education teacher. Um, sometimes I'm at the table, uh, our student support specialist is there so they provide like that trauma informed piece of it. So sometimes you might come in and you think that you're working with something that's really academic and then we find out it's actually not academic. Um, and I can give you an example of that in a minute. And then um, the principal is there, and our literacy coach is there, and sometimes our family intervention specialists are there If in our two title buildings. Who am I missing at the elementary level? I think that's pretty much all of them. Title buildings. Yeah. Uh, are they, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, that's Central Park and okay. Plymouth Elementary. Central yep. Okay, yeah, and so, um, so all of those people at the elementary, I'm going to start there, because the team is a little bit different comprised at the at the secondary level, but those people come together. Um, I would give a agenda to the parent. We have a board, a whiteboard up, and um, after we go around and do introductions, we literally start with strengths. So the entire team talks about what are the strengths of the student? What does a student like? What are they good at? Um, that has been powerful for parents. I think sometimes they don't always get to see the whole team get to talk about all the wonderful things about their kid. Um, so the parent participates, gives strengths, everyone gives strengths. Then we move on to like background information. So is there anything that we need to keep in mind, right? Did the, um, and a lot of times this is information that's shared by the parent. So uh, was a student ever retained or held back in school? Um, has a student ever had some sort of special education involvement that you know, we need to be aware of just to keep in the back of our head? Um, any sort of medical history that might, you know, is there a seizure thing going on that could be playing into it? Most of the time that information comes from the parent and then they share what they want to share and they don't share what they don't want to share, right? And then we move to concerns and we talk about what are all the concerns that we're having? And I really encourage the teachers to list all the things. And um, I always say to the parents, sometimes it feels a little heavy for a second, but most of the time parents don't feel like that because they're like, I knew all these things were happening. And a lot of times parents will add things like, well, when she comes home, she's really super frustrated and tired and it takes two hours to do her homework, right? So we add all the things and then we decide as a team, what are two, the top two things that if we put an intervention in place would have the greatest impact for that kid. Um, so a lot of times it'll be something academic, um, sometimes it might be two academic areas, sometimes it might be something that has to do with social, social skills. Um, so we pick the two things. We talk about all of the things that are currently in place, so if they had uh, an IRIP, yep, yeah, I just I always call it an IRIP so I don't usually call it that, okay. And thank you. And then um, we, if they have an IEP or something like that, we would note that. And then. Um, the whole team, including the parent, brainstorms and talk, like puts out interventions. Like, well, what if we tried this? What if we did check in, check out? So that student has a positive adult. They check in with every morning. That gets them started off on the right foot, and then they check out with them on the way out. Um, a lot of times, uh, it, it's it's a whole team. I, I wish everybody could be in one of them because they're so powerful. Um, a lot of times, we there can be emotions that come at the table because the parents feel so 
uh, supported. Um, I've had quite a few parents who are like, I am just so grateful that there is this team to support my kid. Um, before we leave the table, we set a follow-up date for six to eight weeks, sometimes earlier, right? So if, it's, if this student is really struggling, we might say, oh, we're gonna go four weeks and not six weeks, but six to eight weeks. We set a data goal that says, what are we looking to achieve? So if the student is struggling in uh, reading and their DRA is a two, okay? then we would like them in the next six weeks to get to a DRA of a four. If they don't get to a four, then we're gonna reevaluate and we're gonna say, okay, is it because we had the wrong intervention? Okay, Do we need to try something else? What is DRA? Yeah. Um, okay. See, sometimes I know the letters and not always what they mean. Yeah, just spell it out, make it so clear. It stands for developmental reading assessment. Okay. It's a literacy thing. And the teacher is knowing both um, the coding skills and comprehension skills. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And then we look to see if they're making progress. If they're not, then when the team comes back together, we put in a different intervention. Okay. Does it? Does it? Uh, okay. I'm sorry. Did I over answer? <laughs> okay. I do tend to over answer. Sorry. I, I'm passionate about it, so I just am like, okay, go ahead. This is the first time I've heard of these um, school success team meetings, and yeah. My question is how a student is identified sure. as getting one of these? Yeah. Because to me, it sounds like an IEP meeting. Oh, yes, very different than that. So yeah. Is it teacher directed or could it be parent directed? A hundred percent. So our, right now, the referrals come from either a teacher who maybe has tried all the tricks in their bag and they don't know what else to try. And it really is trying to, so before we, our only option sometimes when kids struggled felt like sometimes special ed, right? Because we didn't have a lot in the middle. So we're working to build that middle tier. So these school success teams fall in there. So we're trying to help kids so they can stay within um, the least restrictive environment and continue to get the interventions that they need. Um, so it, it is very different, just so you know, than an IEP um, or a 504. So they're typically either referred by the teacher who, who says, I need a team to help me think through this because I, I am out of tricks, um, or a parent. We have some parents that request it, um, or the administrator sometimes requests it. Um, those are typically right now how, how we're getting them in. There will later be other ways, like we'll use uh, NWA and data and things like that. But we're, again, in the baby stages, so we started that in February of last year. So there's no specific criteria? There really isn't. Um, I, and the reason I say that mm -hmm. is because for me it was important that any teacher mm -hmm. or parent who felt like their kid needed a, a wraparound approach as far as like a team to come and help um, that I wasn't putting up barriers for that. I think that is so encouraging. We try, we, yeah, we try to get to it at least once a week in whatever situation we can. We're going to use the best weather, obviously, that we can get into, but sometimes you have to deal with what you're dealt. Mm. I've been in the department for three years now. I've been in the department for a year. Awesome.